Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, staying uh, uh, to this graveyard shift talk. Uh, I know it's been a long day, so I'll try to uh, try keep things exciting here. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Nick Pentreath. I'm a principal engineer at IBM. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about the IBM Developer Model Asset Exchange. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm ML Nick on Twitter and GitHub. I work for the Code A team at IBM. That's the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies, where I focus on machine learning and AI. Um, I've been involved in the Apache Spark community for a, a long time. I'm a committer and PMC member of that project um, and wrote a book, Machine Learning with Spark, a little bit out of date uh, now, um, and talk at various conferences and meetups around the world on machine learning related topics. So a little bit about Code A uh, at IBM, as it's called. Uh, when I joined the team, it was the Spark Technology Center focused on um, advancing uh, Apache Spark and, and the uh, surrounding ecosystem. Um, and that included uh, you know, the, the, some of the Python data stack and, and uh, Spark ML. And since then, the team has really expanded its, its, its vision and its focus to encompass the full enterprise AI lifecycle out in open source. So everything we do is open source, uh, and we're aiming to improve that, um, that enterprise stack. So that still includes uh, Spark, of course, that's a core component, um, but also now includes the Python data science stack, uh, deep learning frameworks, um, and deployment, uh, open standards for deployment, as well as two projects which I'll talk about today, the Model Asset Exchange um, and the Fabric for Deep Learning. So enterprise AI and AI deployment, what's the big deal? It's simple, right? You have data, you train a deep learning model, profit, simple. Maybe you don't have a data scientist or you don't have data. Well, you just get a model, you deploy it, profit, right? If you're an app developer or domain expert. So what's the big deal? Well, in reality, it's a lot more complex. There are a lot more steps involved in this process to get anywhere. So first, you've got to find a model that is out there uh, if, if, if one exists. You've got to get the code. You've got to test and verify that that code works, fix it if it doesn't train and or deploy that model and then use it in an application and then profit, possibly. So diving into these steps, step one, find a model. Well, you need to go and find a model that does what you need, that is actually available and free for you to use, and that is performant enough for your application. So perform both in, ter in terms of your know, computation performance, but also in terms of the model performance. Um, does, it, uh, does it perform well enough on that task for what you need it to do? Um, so if you're going to search for a deep learning image classifier, you get a whole bunch of results. You've got to dig through your know, research papers and figure out what is the model that you're even going to use. What is the best uh, model out there for your particular use case? What is the state of the art? So once you've done that, step two is to get the code if it exists. So there might be a research paper out there. Uh, there might be a, you know, an open model you know, in the literature, but does a good implementation exist that, again, does what you need, is free to use in terms of licensing and open source, uh, and is performance enough. So then you've got to go and, and find an actual implementation, you know, perhaps in TensorFlow or some other framework that is out there somewhere, um, and get hold of that code. Or in the case of deploying models, you've got to go and do the same process, but looking for a pre-trained model. So is there a good a model that has been pre-trained on a, a, a suitable data set that is available that, again, does what you need for your application, is free to use, and performance enough. So it might be out there in GitHub, stored somewhere, and that you can download and use. So once you've done the, that step two and you actually have the, the, code, the model code or the pre-trained model, as the case may be, it's not enough to just use it. You have to have to check that it does, again, does what you need, that it is free to use. You've got to go and verify the licenses, the provenance of the code, make sure that it's not including anything um, that, that, that might overstep the bounds or, or make it unusable in your enterprise application. And then finally, that it actually does what it says on the tin and, and performs. Um, and that particular implementation you found uh, performs correctly. The next step is training or deployment. So you've got to go and train that model uh, if it's a trainable model and, and you want to train it on your own data. So much like uh, going and training in the gym, you know, there are many, many, many different ways to train. 
There are many different uh, objectives, there are many different methods, there are many different frameworks out there. Um, too many to count almost. And each one of them has uh, their own, their own uh, set of APIs, their own uh, input output formats, their own way of distributing training, their own way of model serving, um, their own way of running on a cluster, their own configuration, uh, their own way of tuning, uh, hardware requirements, um, configuration, and so on. So this is, this is a, you know, a, a very um, complex uh, task, and there's no one-size-fits-all solution. And most of the time, you might, you know, you, your favorite framework might be TensorFlow or Keras, but perhaps you can't find an Im implementation in that framework, and you have to go and use something else. Uh, and that adds a lot of complexity, because you, 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 you and your team may not actually understand how to, you know, that framework as well, and may not be up to speed on, on how to get it to, to work at scale uh, and be performant. So whether you've got a pre-trained model or you, you manage to successfully train that model, step four, B, is to figure out how to deploy it. So uh, first of all, that model training code may be optimized for batch inference. Uh, it may have no sort of single inference code or it may need to be adjusted. So you either have to write some, something from scratch or adjust that existing code that, that is out there. You then need to package it up, your code, your uh, inference code, your model code, the pre-trained weights, and into some sort of package and deploy that in some way. And again, this is not standardized. Uh, this, is, this is more complex than it sounds. There's, a, there's a, many different ways of doing this. So once you've done all of that, you now need to consume that model. So that means plugging it into your application. And now your enterprise application doesn't know what a tensor is and it doesn't care. So that deep learning model that you've packaged up typically takes in some sort of tensor or some representation, some mathematical thing, and spits out another tensor, some other mathematical thing. But your application, if you're doing uh, your image segmentation or um, text classification, sentiment analysis, it doesn't care about tensors. What it cares about is raw input, taking an image or a piece of text, and getting the output that that application requires, um, a predicted class, a, um, a sentiment score, and what have you. So really, there's this whole, uh, this whole other part of that pipeline, the pre- and post-processing steps that are not typically catered for in those deep learning models themselves, um, and that typically is you know, a bunch of code that sits outside of that, that, pack, that sort of uh, core a deep learning kind of computation graph package. But that also needs to be included in this deployed artifact uh, so that your application uh, can, can actually consume it. And finally, once you do all of that, hopefully you profit. So stepping back to that, uh, that pipeline of steps, uh, we can kind of split them up into three categories. The first is discovery, going and finding and verifying uh, what you need that is out there. Second is execution, actually um, training it or, or getting it deployed. Um, and the third is consumability, which is actually using it. Um, you know, partly it's, it's part of deployment, but it's, it's using it in an application. And uh, we won't concern ourselves with, with whether it's profitable or not. We we'll leave that up to you. So to solve this first step of discovery, that's also simple, right? We'll just use a model zoo. You know, model zoos and model marketplaces are all out there, and then you know, this is the, the, the conceptual uh, illustration of what they look like. They, they're like a library. Everything is nice and neatly packaged, nice, uh, ni nicely indexed. It's easy to find what you want. But in reality, it looks a bit more like this. Um, you know, you've, you've got uh, a whole bunch of models lying around in various places. Um, some of them are, are in a centralized location. Some of them are out in GitHub somewhere, some of them are old, uh, using old versions of a framework. Uh, you've got a lot of research code, which may be a bunch of spaghetti code, which sort of works, but breaks uh, in all kinds of edge cases. Um, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't really work when you want to apply it to your particular data set. Uh, it's impossible to really find uh, you know, exactly what you need in a, in a, in a, in a kind of easy to, to, um, to understand way. Uh, the, the, the model metadata is, is, not, uh, is not indexed and clean. So it's like digging through this pile of, you know, of, of books which has been thrown into, uh, on the floor to try and find what you really need. So to solve all of these problems, uh, the Code8 team created the IBM Developer Model Asset Exchange, or MAX. Uh, and MAX is a, a one-stop place, an exchange, 
to find free and open source deep learning models. Uh, we aim to cover a wide variety of domains, uh, texts, audio, uh, images, uh, you know, healthcare, time series, financial services. It's, it's framework agnostic. There's multiple deep learning frameworks. Uh, it's vetted and tested code and IP, so licensing is, is checked, provenance is checked, the actual uh, inference code, training code is all tested to see that it, that it really works. And the core, is, the core idea is that on the deployment side, you can build and deploy a web service in seconds, and on the training side, you can uh, train on the Fabric for Deep Learning or Fiddle, which I'll talk about shortly, it's an open source framework, or on IBM's Watson Machine Learning Service within a minutes. So on the training side, uh, on the training and deployment side, the, the core of, of Max is open source. Everything must be deployable in open source and tradable in open source. Uh, and for the, the training side, we target uh, Fabric for Deep Learning or Fiddle. Uh, and Fiddle is a, a project that came out of IBM research um, and it forms the core of IBM's uh, Deep Learning as a Service uh, product offering. And the core is completely open. So it's a framework agnostic uh, meta framework for training deep learning models. It runs on Kubernetes. Um, it supports TensorFlow, CAFE, PyTorch, Keras. And it, it, it allows you to, uh, you, you to set up a training script, um, a, a training definition, uh, and pointers to where your training data is, and run that on the, cl on the cluster with GPU support and distributed training. So it's built on this microservice, uh, microservices architecture on Kubernetes uh, with monitoring. Um, and you know, it runs on, on whatever uh, Kubernetes cluster you have. So whether it's local, whether it's uh, you know, IBM Cloud or another cloud, uh, on-premises, uh, native support for GPUs, um, and you know, uh, full support for distributed training. And what has just been announced is support for PyTorch 1.0 uh, in, in Fiddle which includes uh, PyTorch's native distributed training uh, setup and Onyx support, um, and Fiddle also supports distributed training via Horovod. So if you want to uh, read a bit more about that, there's some links to the, uh, uh, to the blog posts. So at a high level, this is what a train the trainable models look like, uh, made up of three components, the training data, more specifically, typically a pointer to where that is, um, uh, you know, in, in an object storage uh, bucket or potentially locally in the cluster. The training code, which, uh, which is responsible for, for taking the data and actually training on it. And a training definition file, which tells, um, which tells Fiddle uh, what, what actual framework to use, um, what, uh, what resources to allocate, and all the other configuration uh, aspects that are required. That's run through a standardized script, which, is part of, which we're developing as part of Max, and this is always a work in progress, but you know, a standardized script to, uh, to package all of those three components up and run it on the Fiddle cluster. And then at the end, you have a, a trained model, which can then be deployed uh, or wrapped up in, in the standard Max way or using uh, some, of, some of the Fiddle plugins that, are, that support um, inference via, let's say, Onyx and, uh, and Selden Core. And for deployable models, we have a similar sort of concept. The deployable model is, is uh, made up of a pre-trained model, which comes from data. You're combining data, a model, computing resources, and, and the expertise to actually train that model, uh, tweak it, and configure it, and tune the parameters. And we end up with a pre-trained model artifact. Um, but that pre-trained model that just does inference, that computation graph in neural networks, is not enough. As I mentioned before, for your application to actually consume that, you need to pre and, uh, pre and post process uh, the, the input and output of that model. Um, and you need to provide an API to, to the application. There needs to be um, a, a sort of interface that it, can, that it can use. So a deep learning asset on, on the, the asset exchange consists of these three pieces. The, that pre-trained model, the input and output pre-processing um, in a standardized manner, um, and the REST API. And once you have that, um, it's packaged up as a Docker container and you can deploy it as a microservice. Um, so you have a, a, a REST API, which has an inference endpoint, which is mostly what you, you're going to use, but also um, some uh, endpoints for metadata about the model and the labels, for example, in classification, um, and a Swagger specification, which allows you to, uh, to explore, explore, explore the user interface, the Swagger user interface, 
as well as um, you know, use automated tooling uh, related to the Swagger API. So a deployable model, uh, you know, the, the highlights on, of the deployable model on Max is that you know, we cover a wide variety of domains at the moment, uh, always obviously add, looking to add more. This pre and post processing step and the inference is all wrapped up in one Docker container behind a generic uh, set of API framework code using Flask REST Plus at this point. Um, so each model is, is in, encapsulated in a model wrapper that has a standardized uh, predict method with a pre and post processing steps. Uh, it uses the swagger to specify you know, the, the API input and output. And because of that, you can you, know, you get a, 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 a Swagger UI Explorer for free. So it means that you can, uh, as a developer, come and explore that API, check the endpoints, look at what the input, uh, input and output uh, is, uh, what the, the spec for that. Um, you can test it out uh, on, uh, in the browser. And then as part of the, uh, as part of the, uh, the, 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 Max, the new Max website that we're working on, we have uh, and, you know, and the, the actual GitHub's, uh, the GitHub repos for the Max models. We have one-line deployments uh, for Docker containers that are hosted on Docker Hub, um, as well as Kubernetes clusters, so you can deploy it in one line of code from the command line. Uh, and then around Max, we have a, a whole bunch of content that we are trying to develop, um, or have developed and will continue to do, uh, which we have, we call code patterns in, in IBM Developer, and these are uh, these are detailed, uh, extended how-to guides about how to you know, uh, go from start to finish in a, um, you know, in a useful, in a useful application or use case. Um, so we have a number of code patterns demonstrating how to actually take that package model and wrap it up and use it in a, you know, easily consume it in a, in an application. So I think I've got enough time to just do a quick demo of what this actually looks like. Okay, so this is what the this is the model asset exchange. Um, this is actually an old site that uh, is, is being updated, and we'll soon have a new, um, nicer looking site. But if you go and, and click on one of the, the models, you come to uh, the underlying GitHub repository. So, uh, as part of this GitHub repo, there's all the model code um, and everything you need to package it up. Uh, there's a, there's a you know an overview with model metadata, a set of references, specification of the licensing. So that is all vetted, and you can go and check out what you know what it looks like. And then you have um, you know, a, a, a one-line deploy deployment for uh, for Docker. So all I really have to do is run that one line, and uh, you know, obviously I've uh, I've downloaded the image already, but it'll pull the image from Docker Hub. Uh, start up the, the model, and in this case, it's, a, it's an object detection model. And then we can go and have a look at the, the Swagger, uh, this, the Swagger user interface. So we've got this set of standardized endpoints, which, uh, which tell you about the model metadata, uh, as well as the labels in the case of certain models like classification models. And then you can make a prediction. Uh, and, and that predict endpoint is, is typically posting uh, some, some raw input to the, the model and getting back the predictions. And you can try it out by, by choosing a file, uh, setting any of the parameters uh, for the API parameters that are necessary, and then executing it. So as part of um, most, most Max uh, assets, we try to create this rich content around it, which shows you a little bit about what it can actually do. Um, this particular one has a, a web app built in, but in some cases, the, the web app is separate. So in this case, we just go to the, the app endpoint. Uh, and we've got an object detector. So we can choose a file. And I'll use one that I took earlier uh, of the room. So it's still working. It takes a little bit of time. Okay, so we can see that uh, it does a reasonable job of detecting a laptop, um, a chair, and what we have here is that uh, the, there's a probability threshold which we can tune in the case of this app. So you know, if we wanted to pick up a couple more 
uh, more items, you can actually see that it, it does an okay job of, uh, of picking up you know, people, chairs, and, and so on, as well as the cup, the coffee cup. And you know, we can go and highlight some of these things, uh, turn them on and off, remove the bounding boxes. So this is, a, you know, this is an example of how you can go from, uh, from start to having a, a fully deployed model um, and actually plugging it into, uh, you know, into a web app that, that does something with that model very, very quickly. So a summary of uh, you know, the, the current status of Max and, and where, we, where we want to take it. At the moment, there we have a total of 22 models, of which four are trainable. Uh, we cover you know, a wide range of, of domains, images, text, healthcare, time series, um, and, and, and more. We have a total of three code patterns uh, that demonstrate, you know, similar to that object detector, which is one of them, demonstrate how to use a, a Max app, uh, a Max model, in an actual uh, application. Um, and further code patterns on actually uh, taking a Max artifact and training it using what's in machine learning or, or fiddle. Um, and in this case, you know, training an audio classifier, so an example of, of transfer learning, so using a, you know, pre-trained weights and then uh, fine-tuning it on some data. One-line deployment, as I mentioned, via Docker and Kubernetes. So in the future, you know, the, we've been working on this for a, a little while, and we want to you know, the, we continue to expand the breadth and the depth of the models. Um, more and more models that can be de deployed that have uh, that have interesting use cases out in the real world, so uh, for, uh, for actual enterprise applications. Um, more trainable models in particular, you know, looking at transfer learning uh, on, on Fiddle and, and uh, IBM Cloud, so taking, uh, for example, image, uh, image classification and, and, and text models, uh, starting with you know, the pre-trained weights and being able to fine tune them on your own data and making it very easy uh, to do that in, in a few lines of code. Uh, our new Max Web Portal, which is launching soon, uh, still in the final stages of, of kind of development here, where we'll have um, uh, we'll have uh, you know, landing pages for each model with with, a, with more detail, uh, example usage, um, and you know, and demos that you can click on straight from the web page to to go and try each model out. Uh, and a lot more Max-related content that we're working on. So more of these code patterns, uh, a lot more meetups and conference talks that, that me and the team will be giving, uh, you know, longer workshops, which, which will explain, you know, some which, which are targeted at, uh, at app developers and explaining how to walk through step-by-step step to take that uh, deployed Max model and create a, web app, a useful web app around it, and some that are targeted at data scientists, um, talking about how to, how to use Max to uh, to kind of standardize um, and make, make it easier to, uh, you know, to take care of some of those steps in, the, in, your, in your workflow, um, as well as how to actually wrap up uh, a model in a, in a standardized max format. Uh, you know, enhancing the production readiness of these models, um, we, the first version of Max was created in, uh, in about three weeks. Um, so you know, the, the, this, there's plenty of things that need to be improved that make it uh, make it actually you know, production ready where you, that, that one line deployment on, on your Kubernetes cluster um, can actually be used, uh, used in a full production app um, you know, without, without any issues. And then improving the Max API framework, again, the first version was developed quite quickly, uh, but what we really want to do is, uh, is you know, take, take that framework code and make it a fully, a fully fledged pip installable library. Um, that can then you know, be, a, be a base framework for deploying deep learning models and, and have you know, behind a standardized API um, and you know, make, it extend, make it easily extensible, uh, remove all the boilerplate uh, around doing that. So in summary, Model Asset Exchange is a one-stop shop for free open source deep learning models, wide variety of domains covering multiple deep learning frameworks, uh, vetted and tested code, licensing, uh, build and deploy in seconds, uh, model service in seconds, um, and train on Fiddle or Watson machine learning in minutes. Thank you very much. Please go check out codea.org for, uh, for some of the other projects, um, uh, more information on Fiddle and Max, um, and feel free to connect with me uh, to, to learn more about any of these. Thank you. Thanks, Nick.
Any questions uh, from the audience before we adjourn for the day? Yes. Uh, well, thanks, great. Um, I, I was just wondering, with transfer learning, you know, in the other rooms you've got people who are talking about, you know, 1,000 GPU and scaling up and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, maybe that's going to happen for the next three years, but eventually there's going to be these stores where you'll be able to get models. And so you'll just get a model which is trained on dogs and you can train it on cats with much less data. So I guess... Do you, do you sort of agree with that, or do you think that there will just there'll be more and more companies with using more and more computing power on larger and larger sets of data? Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I don't think there's. I think it's kind of both, right? There's no one answer. Um, so my view is that the the, the broad usefulness of, of deep learning techniques and you know, AI, as everyone likes to say, is exactly that: that the transfer learning, fine tuning, fine tuning use case. Most businesses, most enterprises don't have a lot of data. And even if they have potentially a lot of data, it's very difficult and expensive to necessarily label enough data. So the more you can do with less, uh, the better, right? The more efficient. And that's where the, the value add's going to be. So that's where pre-trained models um, that, are, that are themselves trained on increasingly larger and you know, diverse data sets, that is, is going to drive the value of the transfer learning. But there will definitely be and continue to be larger you know, larger companies that have access to the data and the expertise and the computing power where they will either be the ones training those large models to, to kind of release and, and effectively put out there um, or in some cases they, they may just need to, to either train from scratch or to, to do some form of transfer learning but still on a huge amount of data with huge computing power. So I don't, you know, my view is, is it's both but the, the, the major value in, especially in the kind of long tail of enterprise is going to be unlocked by by increasingly you know, doing transfer learning on small amounts of data, a uh, small number of examples, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, you brought up in the beginning uh, how the end goal for a lot of these projects are for a company to if you make profit or revenue off the model, but uh, IBM is providing uh, a free platform for people to uh, use pre-trained weights. And I'm wondering, I guess two questions on that. Are you, are customers or I guess users of this uh, platform allowed to take the model serialized and use it in some other framework if they don't want to go down your route of using your containers? Uh, and how does IBM, I guess, profit fr from a business perspective, which I'm not, uh, how are they making money off an open market like this? Yeah, no, all good questions. Um, so the, you know, I'm very fortunate to work in this Code A team, which is uh, an open source team, right? Open source data and AI technology. So, we sit within a, a broader developer advocacy group um, and you know, an open technology group. And our focus is, is out in the open source and doing everything you know, for free effectively out in the open. Um, but of course, that's not you know, fully altruistic. Uh, our, our goal is to, is to give developers the tools they need um, and uh, you know, the education, the, the, the software tools, the, the how-to guides, um, and, and give them way, you know, easy ways to, to use, use those things on IBM's product, you know, cloud products. So that's, what, that's definitely what we'd love you to do. You know, come to, come, if you're going to do it, come, with, come and do it with IBM. Right? Um, that's you know, the short answer about how we ultimately would make money out of it. Um, but in terms of um, you know, the, the openness of, of everything we do in Code A and the openness of Max, it's completely open. It's free, right? Um, specifically, we, you know, the whole goal is to find, um, find pre-trained models in, in that you know, all, all model code that is licensed under you know, uh, liberal licenses, MIT, Apache, and so on. That's a prerequisite. Uh, so that uh, you know, anyone can, can use it for any purpose. So increasingly, the, the, our team is actually training models ourselves to, where, where we can't find good pre-trained weights. Uh, either you know, there are no pre-trained weights uh, models out there, or they may, maybe you know, the licensing is not clear for some reason, and we're, we're increasingly training our own models and putting them out there. So you can absolutely, you know, it's, it's a GitHub repo, a Docker container, and you can deploy it wherever you want, on Google, on Amazon, on-prem. You can take the code and, and adapt it and expand it and do whatever you like with it. But of course, you know, we'd like to make it easy for you to do that with us. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, 
I guess right now you're still building it out, so the number of models you had available was 22. Yeah. What I uh, found, uh, because I'm uh, in academia, is that uh, there was this like constant problem where the state of the art is often very niche and then uh, is constantly moving forward. So what I was kind of hoping uh, there'd be something, and maybe it's related to what you're doing or maybe you know of something, was almost just um, even just an article organizer where whatever the state of the art was, and it would obviously get very, very fine grain because someone might take a core model and then have a variation of it which only solves one, it only works for a subset of problems. Yeah. But do you know anything like that? And I guess, are you guys looking to keep it to a kind of centralized core of models that are pre-trained or is it going to expand to sort of uh, all potential little iterations or? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, over time, uh, as, as a sort of high level goal, you would like to, um, to cover all the bases, right? So um, we, we generally split things into deployable and trainable and, and the deployable models are packaged up for, you, for consumption by app developers predominantly um, domain experts, but you know it can, doesn't have to be the, you know, only that. Uh, obviously, as a, as a data scientist, you may just simply want to use that model instead of going and having to train one. Um, so on the consumption side, you know, and, and making deployable models, um, there definitely is this this, uh, the, this kind of conflict between just adding more and more stuff to the to in, in, you know to the, the the repository, the exchange, um, but also making it kind of useful. Uh, for enough people. So uh, on the margin, yes, we'd like all that stuff, all, all kinds of models in there, but there has to be some sort of, you know, bar that, that it's going to be, you know, useful for more than a few people. So, um, and each model should be, if not, you know, the absolute state of the art, then it should be, you know, close to the state of the art. Um, and typically, you know, it's kind of like, are you, you know, are you going to be running off the master branch? Right of a of a software project, or you're going to be, you know, a stable release, and we we we're probably taking that. Well, we are taking that view in, of models. We won't necessarily have always the latest state of the art, bleeding edge model out there, that is maybe a bit less tested, on the various domains, or and we'll probably have the stable release type of thing. Um, on the trainable side, you know, the, that's still that's where we need to do a lot a lot of work still, um, and make a lot more models trainable. Uh, fortunately, many of the, the models that have pre-trained weights that we've deploy, made deployable, um, you know, typically, typically they, you know, they come from uh, from other model zoos or other locations. Or in some cases, we've we've, we've you know, rewritten models uh, from research papers ourselves, and we're increasingly doing that as a team. Um, but where we've got a pre-trained model, often we have the model code to train anyway, so we can make it trainable fairly fairly easily. Um, and and that's where you know, again, we would welcome actually some. You know, some input from people that want to, that, that you know that would find it useful. What kind of models? Where, you know, what kind of use cases? Are there things that we are, that we should add? You know, so feel free to reach out to me on that. Does that help answer that? Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nick. Cool.